Bible nerds out there, I just love the Bible. I love studying the Bible. Just a good time. And uh, I'm, not, I'm unashamed, too. So it's great, great to have you guys with us. Uh, we're talking about enemies. How many know that we have enemies, that we've got a battle spiritually? Our battle is not only against flesh and blood, but we're dealing with spirits. We're dealing with principalities and powers. We're dealing with spiritual stuff. How many have dealt with spiritual stuff before? Yeah. All right. Like I said, I don't believe there's a demon behind every bush, just every other bush. So I'm a little bit crazy, but not super crazy here. So when we talk about today, we're going to talk about um, really going against mammon. And mammon is a spirit that we need to deal with. But I want to talk about the fish gate because the fish gate represents blessing. It represents our ability to receive blessing. This is going to be a, a challenging message for you today because I want to talk about why we don't receive blessing. Why would anybody not receive blessing? But did you know it's very common for people today to not feel that they're worthy enough to receive the blessing of God? Is that, am I with are you with me this morning? And so we have to deal with some of those issues that cause us to show up at church and, and, and be religious and Christian and read our Bible and do all those things. But did you know it has to be rooted that we know that God is a good God? He's a generous God. He's a loving God. And he's a blessing God. God's in a good mood. Does anybody believe that this morning? So when we look into the scriptures today, um, the first thing I want you to fill in is um, don't step in doo-doo. That's the first thing I want you to just write doo-doo. How many have stepped in doo-doo before? It's not, a good, it's not a good plan, is it? No, I'm telling you, we're going deep right, right away. And what does that mean, not to step in doo-doo? When you step in doo-doo, it means that you're believing that you're saved by what you do-do. And that's just a bunch of doo-doo. It's what Jesus did for us. And what happens is, is we actually get into the bondage if we believe that it's our doo-doo that saves us. Isaiah 28, 13 says this. So then the word of the Lord to them will become, do this and do that. How many know that that's, that's sometimes what happens to us? I can remember as a young Christian. And how many know your pastor's a pretty zealous guy? That's like my, my scripture is never be lacking. I'm just zealous. And how many know I became a little bit of a religious zealot? Don't look at me, honey. Don't look at me. Don't judge me. But I, 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 became, and I, I became so zealous at times that it, one day I was reading the Bible and it hit me. There's nothing I can do to save myself. And I realized that I've been striving to, to please God. And that's an offense to God. And I realized I got backwards because of my zeal. I stepped in doo-doo. And so I don't want you guys to step in doo-doo. Because what it says in Isaiah 28, 13, it says, do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there, so that as they go, they will fall backward and they will be injured and snared and captured. How many know that you get into bondage if you're striving to please God out of your own righteousness? That's why a lot of churches get really mean and nasty. Because they think they're doing it in and of themselves and they think that they need to be pleased to other people who aren't. Dramatic mic drop. Kapush. You guys with me this morning? So what happens is, is we need to follow the do attitudes and not, we, we don't follow the do attitudes, we follow the be attitudes. You guys with me this morning? We are not human doings, we are human beings. And this is where a lot of times we, we get this messed up because the Bible is taught to us as a rule book. Here are the rules. Follow the rules. See you next Sunday. Praise the Lord. Instead, as your pastor, can I pastor you this morning? I'm not giving you a rule book. I'm giving you a book that says you are a ruler now. You understand? There's a huge difference. We're not about, like, and I'm about following God's rules. Don't get me wrong. Those were not ten suggestions. 
They're the foundation of our society. So when I'm teaching you today, it's, it's never about what we do, but it's what he did for us. And I want to just give you, because it's kind of, I'm going to use this word, I hope it's not offensive. It's kind of sexy out there right now to teach that the law is bad. Like, oh, we're grace teachers. We preach the grace gospel. Hallelujah. And can I tell you this? If you have to put a word in front of the gospel, it's a false gospel. The gospel is everything. You don't need to define it with any adjective, my friend. And can I tell you what has happened in some of these cool teachers right now? They think it's cool to teach, well, you know, we're not under the law. Can I tell you, as, as I've studied this, I've gone after this concept because of, of the, just the environment I was raised in. Lord, what does it mean to follow your law? Because my Bible tells me that David said, Lord, I delight in your law. The law is a delight to us. It's not a, a grievance or a bad thing. It's a delight. And this is, the, this is what I think happens in our culture today, Galatians 3.10. Paul warns the Galatians for all who rely on the works of the law. Come on, let me say that again. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. What happens, the dangerous thing, is people begin to rely on doing the law, and they believe that that's actually what saves them. So the law isn't bad. It's just bad if you're relying on it for your salvation. Oh, come on. You guys with me this morning? Am I making sense to you? Doesn't mean the law is bad. I mean, how many have heard people teach out there that the law is bad? You're a legalist if you if you're follow the law. There's, there's this understanding that they're trying to bring forth that's bringing confusion, confusion to the body of Christ. Because the Bible says if, you're, if you don't follow the law, you become lawless. And how many know that we're warned in the Bible that the Bible says in Matthew 24, 12, because of the lawlessness will be increased, the level many will grow cold. If we don't love God's laws, people's heart grows cold. And he says to them, he, told, he tells people who are following him, Matthew 7, 23, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So if we lack a healthy view of the law, we'll, we, we will create a culture of lawlessness or legalism. How many know there's a ditch on the either side of the road? That you can become legalistic where you're depending on the law for your salvation. Or you can become so free that you throw the law out and you become lawless. And can I tell you that neither of those is a good plan? You guys with me this morning? So we have to stay on the straight and narrow. we got to love God's law. we got to see its importance to change our lives, to keep us close to him, and not to allow that spirit of lawlessness to overtake us. How many know that we are actually saved by belief? We are saved, you and I, are never saved by our do-do. We are saved by our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, this is not just a New Testament concept. This is a concept that's found in Genesis chapter 15. It says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Come on. In the first 15 chapters of the Bible, we are confronted with this concept that, the, that you're not saved by following the law, but you're saved by your belief. And that is credited to you as righteousness. How many glad when you see a credit in your account? Amen? You see this number in your account, I'm like, oh, good, that's a credit. I like, you guys like credits? The Bible says that righteousness was credited to your account through your belief not through your works. Where is that found? In Genesis chapter 15. Understand that the Old Testament is not some old thing. We've got to don't go, don't look at that. You'll, you'll get legalistic. Come on. The truths and the concept that you have in the New Testament are explained clearly in the Old Testament. It's not two covenants. It's a one covenant is called the Old Covenant, we call it, but it's actually 
a covenant, and then there's a renewed covenant. The old covenant is the new covenant renewed, and it's fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this same concept in Romans 4, 5. However, to the one who does not know, uh, does, who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. And this, about 500 years ago, Martin Luther began to preach that righteousness comes through faith, through belief. And that's what caused the second great reformation because the church got stuck in doo-doo. Anybody race Catholic here like me? You get stuck in doo-doo. You do this, you do that, you do that, you do this. And hopefully you've done enough. By the time you die, you've done enough doo-doos. And Bible says that your righteousness is as filthy rags to God. I trust in Jesus, what he did, not in what I do, not what I have done. All right, so don't shout me down this morning, guys. Here we are at church, and I want to teach you this morning. It's not about what we've done. It's about what he has done for us. Number two, um, I want to make sure that, that we realize it's about doing. It's not about doing. It's about being. And so the next thing I want you to fill in is we want to, we want to get into the cause of being. That's what we're just put BB, the BB cause, all right? We cause because we're being. God wants you to realize you have become a new creation in him. The Bible is not behavior modification. Try harder, saint. It's about becoming something different. You know, it'd be like a dog. Would, if you take a dog and you could put him through this thing that would make him a human and he would be completely human, you wouldn't have to train this new person, this new man, to stop chasing postmen. Right? Because he's a new creator. Like the dog wants to chase postmen. I always wanted to create postman flavored dog food. I think it would be a big hit. We'll have Jezebel flavored dog food, postman flavored dog food. We'll, we'll be rich. Don't, don't steal my idea. All right? That's mine. But the whole idea is, is when you become a new creation, you don't do what you used to do. It's not about trying to train the dog not to chase the postman anymore. It's about getting them from the old creation into the new creation. Amen? And that only comes through what Jesus has done. It only comes through belief. Your behavior changes as you trust in the Lord. How many have, how many have strived, striven to be more you know, loving and more kind? It's not working. <laughs> But it's allowing, saying, God, I give this to you. You change me. And that's what he does. We see this in Matthew 9, 13. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. This is what Jesus wants from us. He wants us to become something, not do something. This is what it says. Jesus tells us, learn not to do something, become sacrificial, but learn to become something, become merciful. I mean, oh, there's, there's a difference. And we become, the, we become like Jesus as we spend time with them. And the best thing I can do as a pastor is to encourage you on a daily basis, spend time in the Word of God, which is spending time with Jesus. Spend time in prayer. Pray to the Father with Jesus as your intercessor. That's the best thing you can do for this church is develop your own personal time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This nice little Presbyterian church this morning. Got that little golf clap happening. Yeah. Shh. Thank you. All right. So what's the first act that God did toward mankind? It was to bless him. And this is where our society is backwards, and most of us have been raised in a way that we feel like I get a blessing if I work hard. And there's and we are, you know, we're raised by the Puritans. I mean, we know about hard work. There's a blessing in hard work. But can I tell you that God blessed Adam and Eve before they did a single thing. So what we need to do as Christians is we need to learn how to receive that blessing and never base it on how much we read our Bible, how much we go to church, how, how much education we have. Look into the scriptures, Genesis 1, 28. It says, God blessed them and God said to them, 
Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Prior to them doing a single thing, God blessed them. Guys, this is so pivotal for you and I. If we forget that we need the blessing before we do anything, we're going to fail. Before, when I wake up in the morning and I feel like, oh, I don't feel worthy, I don't feel like I'm enough, I stop myself and I declare over myself, I am highly favored. I'm highly flavored too, (laughs) but whatever you want to say. I'm highly flavored and favored, and I'm loved by God. He loves me. He adores me, and it starts your day out like that. This is why we have 10 declarations based on the gates of Jerusalem because it's so important to receive that blessing. First thing God did to Adam and Eve, I bless you guys. But we haven't done it. We haven't, we're not fruitful. We're not multiplying. We're not doing anything you said. You can't do anything unless I first bless you. That's arrogance and pride to think I'm going to actually accomplish something without God's blessing. That's a trap. That's doo-doo right there. And remember what we read in Isaiah 28. The word of God will become to you doo-doo, rule on rule, but you'll be ensnared and captured and fall into a trap. So as your pastor today, trying to keep you out of that trap, aren't you glad your pastor doesn't want you stuck? A couple of you are. When I went to uh, Asia, one of, the, one of the main things I did while, while I was in uh, Asia, in China, in Cambodia, is I would teach on the blessing. The Chinese are a wonderful people. Please pray for our Chinese brothers and sisters right now. But when I would go there, I would teach on the blessing. And, I would, and the Chinese people are some of the hardest working people, especially when it comes to the gospel. They work hard. They work so hard, their marriages fall apart. And so I would go there and, and teach. And I would, I would always use this example of the bug. And how many have ever seen a bug who gets stuck on his back? What's Mr. Bug doing on his back? What's Mr. Bug thinking? I'm moving my legs, but I'm not moving. This is what I usually do to move, but nothing is happening. And suddenly, you flip Mr. Bug over, and he starts moving again. Now, I hope you and I are smarter than Mr. Bug, because this is where people get stuck as Christians. They're in in death mode, because that's actually how a a bug dies. A bug always dies on its back. How do you have the strength to get on your back? That looks like a murder. I mean, how did you do that? You know what I'm saying? But they just die on their backs. And we call that the death position. And that's where many Christians are. They're still trying, I'm going to do this for God. But they haven't let God turn them over and bless them. That's why their lives aren't moving forward. How many want to move forward? All right? Can I tell you that, you know, as a a follower of Jesus, this is one of the most difficult things It was for me. I was in full-time ministry and didn't receive the blessing of God. I was still working for it. I worked hard for it. You guys, my wife, I'm driven. Like, God, I'm going to do this for you and do this for you. And I'm, I'm, how many know I'm still pretty driven? But I'm not doing it in, in the strength that Chris has. I'm doing it in the strength. I'm doing it with the blessing intact. And so a number of years ago, I, I, I wrote a book called Heaven's Dynasty that was focused on that blessing that the father gave to his son, Jesus. And the Hebrew word barach means to bless, to empower, to enable, to succeed, to prosper, to be fertile, and to live long. This is one of the keys to culture. How many know the Jewish people practice the blessing? They pass the blessing on to their children. They have a a specific event called the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah that they invite the family and friends and hundreds of people. It's as big as a wedding. And what they do is they bring up their their soon-to-be teenage son or daughter, and they have a celebration for this child, and they bring them up in front of people, and and they look at the child, and they say, as a father, I bless you. You're mine. I love you, and I'm proud of you. 
That's what the entire celebration is about. It's as big as a wedding. Why does the Jewish culture do that? Because they have, they have protected that concept of the blessing. It's incorporated into their culture. The Christians, we don't do that. Did you know the Jewish people are some of the most influential? They're the most influential people group on the planet. 20% of Nobel Prizes have gone to Jewish people. They are uh, the leaders of almost every movement. They're not just actors. They're, they're, they're in charge of the movie studio. They're not just a teller at the bank. They own the bank. I mean, that's a good thinking right there, right? They're not just doctors or nurses. They own the stinking hospital. I'm going somewhere with this. Why? Because God loves the Jewish people? Yeah. But what if it's they've incorporated the blessing in the culture and we as Christians haven't? Ouch. We have to think, how do we incorporate a blessing? A blessing is different than a prayer. A blessing is something you look into somebody's eyes and say, I love you, I'm proud of you, you belong to me. You should always do that to your children. You should get down on your knees, look them into the eyes and tell them, I'm proud of you, I love you, you're amazing. I love what God's doing to you. What if they screw up? You tell them that anyway and you say, don't do that anymore. <laughs> Amen? Right? You're better than that. So that's what the blessing does. And, if, and this is what I think a lot of charismatic churches miss, miss this. Blessing establishes identity. Prophecy establishes your destiny. So we're big in the prophecy telling people, God showed me you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. In so many charismatic churches, they focus on prophecy, and that's good. But can I tell you, they don't feel blessed. We haven't blessed their identity so they never have enough strength to reach that prophetic destiny that God's called them to. That's why we need to learn how to be a people who can bless others. This is the most important concept that you're going to find that I think as Christians, we, we overlook. And I want to talk just a few minutes about the times that God's voice was audible. audible. The Father's voice was audible in the New Testament. How many know that would be pretty cool? Right now, all of us, God just goes, hey, everybody. <clears throat> I'm not saying he would say that, but what I'm saying is there's four times that the audible voice of the Father was heard. And the first time that God spoke in the New Testament, is he, it was at the baptism of Jesus. And it says this in Mark 1.1.1. It says, a voice came out of the sky you are my beloved son who I am pleased with. You see, whenever God is speaking to his son Jesus, you know what he's saying? He's releasing a blessing. That's the same blessing that a Jewish father gives his daughter and son. I love you. I'm pleased with you. And you belong to me. How many know that those very words can shift a, 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 a child? It can prepare them for adulthood because they know who they are. They know that it's not based on what they've accomplished, but it's based on that you came from me, and I love you, and I'm proud of you. You know, we have done bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs here at the church, and we've gathered some of the people, some of the toughest cookies you can imagine as fathers, and we said, we're going to train you how to bless your daughter and bless your son. And they would go, and we'd take them to the class, and here's these big tough guys up here bawling can't even hold themselves together because they're blessing their daughter and they're blessing their son. And they're all tough in the meeting, but you get them before their child and you bless them and, and they're just like a wreck. It's always a mess. Whenever you bless somebody, it's a mess. Whenever I was blessing my children so many times, I made a total fool of myself. You think I couldn't, can't talk now? I was like, because it's, it's, you're imparting something and it's not supposed to be all kind of cute, nice. But it says this, that we see this at the blessing, at the baptism of Jesus. The Father gives him a declaration, and he gives it to him privately. You are my son. But there's also times when it's a public declaration. This is my son. And there are times that we need to hear this privately in our prayer times, in our quiet times, 
where you let the father say, I love you, my child. You belong to me. This is part of what we do in our declarations. I'm highly valued in heaven. Lord, you love me. I receive your blessing today. And once you receive the blessing, then go out and conquer the world. But don't you dare go out into that world without knowing you're blessed by God. You see, the second time it happened was at the transfiguration. And again, what does the father say? Matthew 17, 5 and 6. While he was still speaking, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's like, God, don't you have anything else to say to Jesus? That's all he talks about is this blessing. I love you. I'm pleased with you. You belong to me. Like, that's what the Father is always saying to Jesus. And that's why he was able to fulfill his ministry. You see, I used to teach that, that when, when Jesus was baptized, that initiated him for his ministry until I, I had this encounter with the Lord and I realized, wait a second, it wasn't the baptism. It was when the Father blessed Jesus. It, it empowered him to step up and stand in that place where he was called to do what he was called to do and what he was called to accomplish. And he did it. But his ministry didn't take off till he received that blessing. Can I ask you this morning, you want your ministry to take off? I want your ministry to take off. You gotta get blessed. Don't go, don't leave home without it. Right? God, I want to get the blessing today. Where are you going? I'm going to get the blessing. If you don't have the blessing, you need to be like a fish that's out of water and just flop around to get back into that blessing. Right? We need to stay in that blessing. And that's one of the keys that we find. Jesus was continually being told by his Father in heaven, you belong to me. I love you. I'm pleased with you. That's so good. Last thing I want to touch on is that we need to say never to never enough. Many times, most of the reason why we struggle is because we live with this voice inside of us that says, you're not enough. You wake up in the morning, you hear you're not enough, and then you strive all day, you go to bed at night, you lay down, and what's the enemy say? You didn't do enough today. His banner over you is, is love, not, not good enough. This is, what the, this is what the spirit of mammon continues to try to tell you. You're not enough. See, the, the spirit of mammon is what we battle at the fish gate. Our enemy at this gate is mammon. It's a spirit. It has a voice. And especially when you try to give to God. Because this is somewhat connected with your finances. There's something to do. Billy Graham said this. He said that if, if a person gets his attitude toward money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area in his life. There's something about finances. And my message is not on finances today, but there's something about the fish gate and there's something about that spirit of mammon that gets tied into your own value before God. Because the spirit of mammon always says you'll never have enough. That spirit of mammon is always coming against the kingdom of God. The Bible says this about the spirit of mammon in Matthew 6.24. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. When we talk about the spirit of mammon, this spirit is governing, is a governing spirit over money. But we as Christians, we're not governed by mammon. We're governed by manna. It's, it's what we receive every day. Like the, the, the children of Israel received in the wilderness, it was, it was something they trusted, they believed for, and God provided for. Where mammon, on the other hand, it's a spirit that just says, you'll never have enough. And when we look into the Scriptures, we find that we have to begin each day with, I am, the, I am blessed, I'm highly valued by God. Now, one of the titles for God is El Shaddai. How many have ever heard El Shaddai before? And El Shaddai is, it's a Hebrew word, and it comes from, uh, it's a title of God. It's a, it's a title that God is, he, he says, this is my title. I'm the God who is enough, or I am, uh, some, some translations translated it, God Almighty. 
um, in, the, in, in the translation, the name translation, I translated El Shaddai as the God who is enough. How many know you need the God who is enough in your life? Because when you're struggling with anxiety or fear or things aren't going well, you're always, wait a second, I serve El Shaddai. I serve the God who is enough. Now, if we look into the, the Hebrew, El Shaddai is the God of more than enough. Enough is that which is required to meet our needs. So he's not just the God of enough. He's the God of more than enough. And when we look into the scriptures and see, that's how God wants you to title him. Like, I want you to be the God who is more than enough for me. That's not just has to do with our finances, but it has to do with our life and our work and our time and our efforts. You see, me plus God is a great team. Me minus God's not such a good plan. So you and I have to say, wait, you are the God who is enough. Even when I don't measure up, you are the God who is more, more than enough. How many have heard the, the song, Jira? Jira, you are enough. Great song. Um, I heard that song and it freaked me out because I had just getting ready to send out my Bible. I'm like, wait a second, did I miss this? So Jira is actually the Hebrew word which means provider. God provided the ram. Doesn't mean more than enough. Doesn't mean you can't sing that. But the emphasis is God provides. And there's, I don't, when I read that, I thought, uh oh, did I mess that up? So I wanted to clarify that. But which book of the Bible speaks? Which, which book of the Bible uses El Shaddai more than any other book of the Bible? Does anybody know this? Genesis? Close. You probably won't guess it. The book of Job. Job is always calling God. You, you're just reading that right now. He's always calling God El Shaddai. How many know Job was going through some stuff? Okay, you are the God who's more than enough. Where's all your stuff, Job? Because I serve the God who's more than enough. Come on, right? So what, no matter what you're going through, just say, God, he's the God who's more than enough. Because you're going to be faced with this mammon spirit that wants to say, you're not enough. And I say, I know, but I serve the God who is more than enough. And when you begin to receive that blessing, you understand what happens when you get that blessing. It empowers you to succeed. It empowers you to say, God, you've called me to succeed. You've called me to have breakthrough. I'm going to press through this. It got Job through, remember? Remember? The Bible never says to remember Job's suffering. The Bible never says that. James, it says, remember how it ended for Job. He was doubly blessed because he served the God, El Shaddai, who was more than enough. So it's, it's key for you and I that we first receive from God. Lacking blessing in the spiritual realm is like living in poverty in the natural realm. You just feel like I don't have enough. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm in poverty. That's what happens when you that's what happens in the spirit when you don't receive God's blessing. When we lack resources, we live continually in anxiety, fearing that we will not have enough. And I see so many people that have never received that blessing. They haven't received it from their own father or they haven't received it from their own mother. But the cool thing is, even if you don't receive it from your own mother or father, God himself has a blessing for you. And we're going we're gonna to bless you today. We're going to take communion at the end of the service today. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to speak that blessing over you. But can I tell you, what, what does the blessing represent? The blessing comes at this place where we just receive it because we know that our value was determined by what Jesus did for us. And so many of us resist being blessed, resist receiving freely. How many have a hard time receiving a gift? Come on, isn't it hard? It's like, oh my gosh, you know, why do you feel hard? If you're not a good receiver, can I tell you, it's a sure sign that you struggle with the blessing. It's truth. I'm stepping on your toes today. What happens is, is you 
are when somebody gives you something, you immediately freeze. Oh, no. It's exposing that now I have to either do something back for you because I can't just receive freely because I don't feel like I have enough worth in myself to just receive a free gift. But can I tell you that if you can't receive, you'll never be saved. True or false? If you can't freely receive, then you can't be saved. You thought I was going to make it harder for you, wouldn't you? Like, you can't be saved unless you do, 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 do. The issue is you have to learn how to freely receive the love of God and the gift of Jesus Christ. You have to freely receive it. And that will mess you up because you're like, I'm just going to receive it. Yep. Ouch. What do you want from me, God? I want you to receive my blessing. And then from that, you're going to do the work of God. But if you're not grounded in learning how to receive, you can't be saved. All success begins with the blessing and then increase, th increases through gratefulness into a place of generosity. That's one of the keys is we receive the blessing and then we increase our gratefulness. Lord, thank you so much. For every little thing, thank you so much. And then it turns us into being becoming generous people. And people, cha people are challenged with this. I was thinking this morning about, about the blessing. And the, and the blessing is a, is a very fragile thing. How, how many have ever played that game before where you have two people and they both have an egg and they throw it back and forth? Then they take a step back. And then they throw it again. And it's, it's challenging because you know what happens to eggs? They, they're kind of messy, right? Kind of messy. And so it's scary. I think that's what the blessing is. We feel like that's what the blessing is like. We're, we're in this game, and God says, I want to bless you. Here you go. He throws it from heaven, and you're like, Whoa. you're trying really hard. Because you don't want to mess it up. You're fearful. You're scared. And so what takes place is, is we're, we're, we're scared. But God wants to give you a blessing. Did you know that? He wants to, he wants to impart to you a blessing. Mike, go stand up here. Let's, we're going to try this, all right? All right, you ready? Now, what's Micah feeling right now? Because I want to give him a blessing today. And, but he's a little nervous. Why? Because I don't know if he's equipped. I don't know if he's really equipped to catch it. He doesn't know. I, I'm, I've been practicing my, my uh, around the back move too. And so he doesn't know when it's coming or how it's coming. But when, when we throw this up in the air, are you ready? Sure. How are you feeling? All right. Here we go. Okay. Good job. Good job. All right, so now go ahead, take a step back. Take a step back. Come on, come on, let's try it. Okay, good job, good job. All right. Now, can I tell you right now that, here, bro, can you clean up? Well, it's okay. See, the blessing can be messy, but can I tell you this? When did Jesus receive his blessing? Received it at the very beginning of his ministry. And the cool thing is that we learn is that Jesus went through everything he went through because he had already been blessed by his Father in heaven. Why was God continually blessing Jesus from heaven? Why was there a loud voice? You're my son. I love you. I'm pleased with you. So when Jesus went to the cross... See, some of us would think once Jesus got through the cross, then the Father could say, now I bless you, my son. You've accomplished that work. But, you know, Jesus went through the torture and the pain, the rejection and the betrayal with his Father's blessing intact. You know, even the translation of our Bible where it says, Lama 
Sabachthane. We translate it in our Bibles, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you know in Aramaic, that's not what it says, and that's what Jesus was speaking. Jesus said, my God, my God, for this I have come. That's what it says in the Aramaic. He, God wasn't forsaking him. Jesus was saying, I came to do my Father's will. You see, like this egg here, when Jesus was on that cross 2,000 years ago, it was like putting this egg in boiling water because I can, it's hard boiled, my friend. I scared some of you, didn't I? You see, what happened on the cross is that blessing, I was like going through the boiled water. It was fragile, but Jesus went through the torture and the pain on that cross with his Father's blessing intact. And can I tell you that that, that made that blessing solid. You don't have to stress out or be anxious. Oh, here it comes. I know I'm going to mess this up. I've got to be ready. I've got I've to be ready for this thing to come in. It's hard-boiled, man. Don't have to worry about it. You can catch that. Get ready because God has his blessing for you.